I, um, I'm going to talk today about a little bit about arrhythmia in general and um, some of the information that I have to it. And we're going to talk about the services that we offer here at Concord Hospital. So first of all, people hear the word arrhythmia. It comes from the Greek arrhythmos, which actually means no rhythm. I have no rhythm, but <laughs> it's not no rhythm. It's just an abnormal rhythm. And um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is just sort of go through a little lesson on arrhythmias. I'm going to talk about some of the common ones, a little bit about the, some of the less common ones. And we'll talk a little bit about the field of electrophysiology, which is the study uh, and uh, diagnosis and treatment of arrhythmias. And, um, and that's changed a lot over the years, over the decades. And, and I have a couple of little videos that will illustrate those changes in a fairly profound manner. And then um, we'll talk about the services that we offer at Concord Hospital. And then at the end, hopefully, there will be some time for questions and answers. I'm not big in PowerPoint. Um, I did most of my schooling and everything when it was still chalkboard. Not even dry erase board, which I can see they have. Them. And so I'm going to be doing a lot of writing on the easel. Not a lot of words, so it'll, just be, it'll be like pictures and drawings and stuff. Um, can everybody see the easel like where it is right now? If you want me to move, I can move it out in the middle maybe too once we get to the stage where I'm going to be using it. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is probably the most common arrhythmia that we see and that exists out in the, in the world is something called atrial fibrillation. And just looking at the number of people in this room, there's almost certainly at least one person in a group of people that has this, his <laughs> hands going up, and probably more than that. Um, and it, depending on the population you're looking at, it can be upwards of 10 or 15% of, of people that will get this. And I, I tell my patients that this is like arthritis. It's not quite that common, but it's pretty close. And, and it is the disease that affects people as they get older. And so you can see here, people who are less than 55 years old is very rare, it's very unusual. But as you get older, the rate goes up. And, um, and so it's something like 10 to 12% here for patients who are older than and, um, and in, in some patient populations, uh, it's higher than that. And so, um, some of the things about, about atrial fibrillation, aside from it being fairly common, are it does have certain risk factors. There are things that can make it more common um, than uh, or put you at a higher risk besides just being older. And it's some of the things that we see in our um, in our population in the United States right now. And one of the big ones is the rising obesity trends. People are getting bigger. I always tell people, like, look at their you know elementary school photo that was taken. Even some of my patients that are in their like you know in their forties and see the person who was like the fat kid or whatever in their class, and then do they look like the fat kid now? No, they don't. Everybody has just gotten bigger over the last 30 or 40 years, and that's something that we see bigger patients are more likely to have atrial fibrillation, so we think that there are going to be even more patients with AFib in the future as, as people are getting older and bigger. Um, it's also associated with the some other medical problems like high blood pressure, diabetes, other heart problems, heart valve problems, um, something called sleep apnea. So these are all things that can contribute to um, the AFib. And the AFib is um, it's not a dangerous arrhythmia. It does increase the risk of stroke, and that's a big deal. Nobody wants to have a stroke. And that is a preventable type of stroke if we know that somebody has atrial fibrillation of various medications and things that we can do to reduce that risk, we can eliminate it, we can reduce it. And that's an important part of what we do. Um, and other than the risk of stroke, though, it's not, it's 
not a dangerous arrhythmia. It's, it's mostly a nuisance. It can cause people symptoms. Some people no symptoms. Some people lots of symptoms. And there's a really a range with that. And um, but it, I always tell patients that I see that have this. It's very important. This is not going to make you drop dead. It's not dangerous in that manner. And that brings us to what's probably the second most common arrhythmia, although it doesn't seem that way um, in practice, and that's because a lot of these patients never make it to the doctor, and that's sudden cardiac death. And that's this is sort of taking a spectrum from the AFib, which is generally a benign thing, to this, which is something that no one wants and, and is, is probably the most worrisome thing that I deal with in my medical practice. And, and, um, and the numbers uh, for sudden cardiac death are a little hard to know because a lot of people that die suddenly out in the community, they may be labeled with this. It may be some other type of non-heart-related thing, but nobody really knows. Um, the overall um, risk of this is estimated somewhere between 5 and 15 percent. I think it's probably on the lower end of that spectrum. Um, but this is also something that does seem to increase with with age, although you can see it doesn't increase quite as dramatically as, um, as the AFib, and also like the less than 55 is not, is not listed in here. And it's also a lot more common in men than it is in women, and that's true of heart disease in general. Um, and so the risk, the risk factors for this really parallel the risk factors for what's called coronary disease or blockages in the heart. The strongest one by far is, is tobacco smoking. Um, but family history plays a role. Um, other, other heart disease risk, risk factors like high blood pressure, um, sedentary lifestyle, um, diabetes, and so forth. And so, This is a video I have. So sudden cardiac death is um, is something that it does increase with age, but it's something that uh, it's, we worry about in young people. It does happen in young people too. And this is a video of a basketball player um, who died suddenly. Um, Hank Gathers in 1990 while playing a collegiate basketball game. He was like one of the, probably one of the best players in um, NCAA Division I, one of these people that would often score 40 points a game kind of thing. And he had actually been diagnosed with something which is pretty rare called um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And there are a couple of things about this that are, that are concerning. One is that um, Everybody's just kind of standing around watching him. And so one of the big things that has been an improvement over the last 27 years since that's happened is that I think right there you can sort of see him. He's going to just kind of collapse. Maybe it's a little bit later. But awareness of, of cardiac arrhythmia, and, and there he just goes down. So you can see he's playing this high-level basketball game. He's fine one minute, and the next he's not. And he sort of has some convulsions, and he tries to get back up, and he, um, and he collapses again, and just, he basically dies on the basketball court. And, um, and I'm not going to show any more of it uh, than that. But, um, so, um, so there have been a number of advances with um, sudden cardiac death. It's something that has, um, it's still a big problem. But awareness and treatment, I think now if something like that happened, um, it would have been recognized for what it was a lot sooner. One of the concerning things later on in that video, nobody ever does. CPR or anything, um, and I think nowadays um, that happens more quickly. More people are sort of aware of the need for that. There are external defibrillators all over the place, um, which are devices that are designed for the lay person to basically attach these pads, and they have voice instructions in English that say, attach pads, 
you know, stand back from patient, like shock recommended, something like that, which was not available in 1990, would have been available for for this for this guy and would have would have saved his life. Um, and so, and then there are other advances, um, more specific to electrophysiology in particular, and what I do. Um, that are, that are treatments for high-risk patients, and we'll get to that. Um, so those are the two most common arrhythmias that we see, um, and, uh, or that we worry about, and, um, and there are others. There's, um, I don't even know if I have a slide to list some of the others. Um, do I? Yes, okay. Another common thing that we see people for is um, the medical term is syncope. Um, it's fainting, basically, when, when people collapse. It's kind of like sudden cardiac death, but you wake up from it, I guess, is the way to describe it. Although it's not really, because it's not always, it's not always something dangerous, and sometimes it's something that, in fact, most of the time, it's something that's very benign. But there's a lot of anxiety around the diagnosis of it. So heart rhythm doctors, because some, actually, you, um, causes of fainting or syncope are heart related, but because they are, we're sort of the experts in this. And this is something that's pretty common, and I, one of my mentors when I was at the Dartmouth said, everybody's allowed to faint once. <laughs> but when they fainted more than once, then they should see me, kind of thing. And so, and it's super, I think, um, probably like more than half of the population will pass out at least once in their life. So it's very common, but recurrent episodes are less common. And we find that this also increases with age, and I think a big part of that is medications. People get put on medications for blood pressure and other things, and it leads to this. And it's good to have somebody that understands the nuances of, of how these medications can interact and cause these episodes. Um, but most of the time, it's not it's not worrisome. So other things that we see um, are uh, are sick sinus syndrome or heart block, which are the two um, most common reasons that people get pacemakers put in. We'll talk a little bit about pacemakers later. Supraventricular tachycardia is a um, is a rapid heartbeat that often affects younger patients. It does um, sort of. A lot of people in their teenage years get it, and then, um, and then sort of later in life, actually, in women around menopause, because a lot of these are hormonally um, mediated, um, will have supraventricular tachycardia. And this is like one of the things where electrophysiology really made its, um, made its mark uh, early on, was the treatment of this through catheters. And, um, and then other conditions that we treat, palpitations, people can have extra heartbeats or arrhythmias or various other things that can make them feel like their heart is skipping or pounding. Atrial fibrillation can do that, SVT can do that, um, and, and so that's something else we see people for a lot. Um, and so, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit more about some of this stuff later. I'm going to draw some pictures, but I want. I think I'm going to move the easel out to the middle um, after I've gone through. Well, maybe I'll draw some pictures now. <laughs> so I've got this timeline here. Um, so if I bring it up closer, is it going to be out of the, because then you guys can't see it. Is this? How's that? So, um, so I'm going to kind of go through the. This is a brief history of EP. Um, it doesn't have all of the various advances, but it has a lot of the sort of big stuff um, that has happened. And um, and I'm going to draw a picture to sort of illustrate each one of these things. So, in 1958, the first pacemaker, sure, the first pacemaker was, was put in, and a pacemaker is a device that helps the heart beat when it can't beat on its own. And so, your heart, your heart has like four chambers, and, um, and the blood comes in the top chambers, and it 
goes out the bottom chambers. And the heart has its own natural pacemaker, which is up here in one of the upper chambers. And then there's an electrical system that moves the heartbeat down to the bottom part of the heart. And so a little electrical impulse gets, uh, gets sent out here and makes the top chambers beat. And then it goes through this special connection and makes the bottom chambers beat. So you get bump, 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 bump. The first pacemaker that was put in was this big thing. It was so big that they had to put it down in the abdominal cavity. And it had a wire that went to the bottom part of the heart. And it had an electrical impulse that it delivered. And it just delivered this electrical impulse like, kind of like a clock. It just boom, 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 boom. Very basic, very rudimentary, not sophisticated at all. If the heart started beating on its own, the pacemaker kept going because it couldn't tell. It just went. And um, for a long time, pacemakers were these big things in the abdomen. Um, battery life was an issue because battery life was not very sophisticated back then. At one point, I think there were pacemakers that actually had a nuclear battery with like plutonium in them. And, um, and so, you know, you're like walking around with this thing. And, and they were huge. And, um, and when I was up at Dartmouth, we, they had a patient actually had one of those that had like just a few years before I got there, they had finally like taken it out and put in a newer one. And there was somebody else who had an early pacemaker that had a rechargeable battery. But the thing was, the battery only lasted for like 24 hours. They literally had to charge it every single day. And if they didn't, their heartbeat would get slower and slower and slower. And then, and this guy was funny because he, he was still there when I was there. And he like, he's like, no, oh, it's working fine. I don't want a new one. And finally, they convinced him to get one of the newer ones, which has like a 10 year battery life. Like, well, yeah, it's better. I got it. So that was 1958. Pacemakers actually came along quite a bit um, after that. Um, and, and pretty, I don't know when they finally started getting really small, but like, I think in the, by the 70s, pacemakers were quite a bit better than the first original abnormal ones were. And then in 1980, the first implantable defibrillator was put in. And so an implantable defibrillator is, is something that um, detects a dangerous arrhythmia like Hank Gathers had, and it delivers a shock. And it does this automatically. It's inside the body, and it does not, you know, it doesn't need somebody there with the paddles or with the thing. And if you're off by yourself and no one's there, it still works. And the first one of these went in, this big thing, it weighed about a, weighed about a pound, and it had, actually I think it was down in the abdomen too, this is before my time, I've never really seen one, but it had patches that a cardiac surgeon would put onto the outside of the heart. And those patches would be how the shock was delivered. You have, whenever you're doing it, anything with electricity, you have to have a circuit, it has to make a circle. And so it would go through to this patch and through the heart and into that patch and back down. And they were pretty basic back then. Um, they only got put in patients that were extremely high risk, sort of people who had had, um, had survived an episode or more than one episode of cardiac death and who had been put on medications and the medications weren't working and things like that. Um, for a long time, that was sort of the situation with those. So the first one was in 1980, like the very first one. And then in 1981 was the first catheter ablation. And this was for something called supraventricular tachycardia, or SVT, that I had mentioned earlier. And I'm just, um, let's see. So, again, the heart. Um, and this is this is a this is a procedure we do all the time now, and the technology has like gotten way more advanced. But basically, there were patients who were having these tachycardias where they have a normal electrical system that sends the electrical signal down, like I showed you, 
the bump, the bump. But then they would also have like an extra electrical pathway, we call it. And this allows a short circuit to happen where there's an electrical loop that goes around and around and around. And every time it goes around and around and around, every time it does that, the heart beats, so it beats very quickly. And this is it's probably the most basic type of SVT. And so, in 1981, this guy out at UCSF in San Francisco, um, Melvin Scheinman, um, discovered that you could go in there and get rid of this by heating it up. Now, before that, people that would have this would have to, the surgeon would go in and they would find this extra area. It's usually, it's like a little strip of muscle that's not supposed to be there and they would cut it. And that involved open heart surgery. But, after, but with the um, with the catheter ablation, the first one they actually went in and they um, and they delivered like this huge blast of electricity. I think they actually used a defibrillator to deliver you know 700 volts just and it's like really risky. It works, but it could like blow a hole inside your heart. So um, that that was 1981 was the first one and. Um, it's, as the 80s progressed, and then definitely by the early 90s, they started to come up with more sophisticated methods of delivering this heat, um, and ended up using something which is what we still use now called radio frequency. And it's really just electricity. Um, the electricity out of the wall is like, you know, it's 120 volts and it's 60 hertz. That means that it goes between positive and negative 60 times a second. And what we use, the voltage is lower than that. Um, and the um, the uh, speed that it goes between positive and negative is 700,000 times a second. So it's radio frequency, like AM radio, basically, right? 700 kilohertz is AM radio. 700 kilohertz, you basically have a little tiny antenna on the end of a long, skinny plastic thing, and we put that antenna right where we want to heat up some tissue, and then we deliver electrical energy through it, basically a, a radio transmitter, and it heats up the area, but it doesn't like blow it apart. At least we can um, and there's um, and so the idea is that it can heat up just that little tiny spot and get rid of it, so that the SVT goes away. And and so that was one of the advances between 1981 and, and when this was only being done in one place and probably in 1990 to 1995 when it became very widespread. You know, it was like, I think they were doing them in, um, in New Hampshire in the early 90s, like up that dark and then back down in um, Manchester. Um, didn't start doing them here until my partner, Dr. Chadash, who you'll see in a photo a little later, uh, came here. Um, seven years. Um, so that was the first SVT ablation. In 1998, the first atrial fibrillation ablation was um, was performed by a guy in um, Spain, Miguel Hasaguer, I think is his name. And so he discovered that AFib comes from certain areas in the heart in most patients. There are blood vessels in the heart, most people have four of them, that bring the blood back from the lungs. Usually there's two coming back from the right lung and two coming back from the left lung. And the AFib tends to start up, particularly when it's not really advanced AFib, tends to start up in areas around these blood vessels. And so he discovered that if you can wall, sort of get rid of those electrical signals, you can get rid of the AFib at least for time, and um, often for, for, for several years. And so they originally did this by just going in there and sort of heating up all this heart tissue. But then they discovered that, well, you can end up building, building up scar tissue and these blood vessels shrink down, and then the blood can't get back to the lungs, and, and so 
these days we tend to make a big circle around everything and avoid actually doing any ablation inside of the blood vessels because it prevents problems like blood vessel narrowing or what's called stenosis. And so 19, what did I say, 98 was the first one of those. And it started becoming widespread in the sort of mid 2000s, first decade of the, of the 2000s. And this is actually now probably one of the most common procedures we do because AFib is the most common arrhythmia that we see. And so this is a fairly common thing. Um, in the mid 2000s, um, it started to become a thing where we wouldn't just heat, but we would also freeze. Freezing has some advantages. In, um, in SVT, if somebody has an abnormal pathway and it's right next to the normal electrical system, if you go in there and you, you try, to, try to get rid of it, you run the risk of damaging everything and then they have no normal electrical system and then they need an artificial pacemaker. Um, freezing gives us more ability to do what we want without doing what we don't because it takes time for the freezing to have an effect. The heating is immediate, but the freezing takes a number of minutes until it creates the sort of ablation. And so that was something in the mid 2000s that came out and more recently has been used for atrial fibrillation ablation quite a bit um, because we found out that you can take sort of a big freezing balloon and put it here and it, and it can cover up the area around these veins and freeze them, and it's a little bit, um, maybe it's a little easier than doing these circles. Um, and so that was something that came out in, in the mid 2000s. And then in, um, in the early 2010s, there's been a bunch of stuff that's come out, like in the last five or 10 years. I actually have some, some stuff to pass out here, some handouts and, uh, and some dummy devices. So, um, yeah, do you want to help? Right. So these are like life-size, I'm going to keep at least one of them so I know I'm not going to. Those are some life-sized kind of pictures of these different devices. And then I have actual, in most cases, these are not real. They're not going to, they're not going to shock you or anything. But, um, but some different things here. Um, and I'm going to show them what you all. I'll wait, I'll wait for everybody to get at least some of the flyers. Yeah, I don't know that there's going to be enough for everyone, but there should at least be enough for a couple for each table. I think there might be a meeting that um, So, the original pacemaker was huge, um, and I don't have any of those. And the original defibrillator was also huge, and I don't have any of those either. This is a current sort of standard pacemaker, modern pacemaker. Um, it usually has two wires. I just brought one wire, and it's not really the right wire. It's just the one I have to get around. But, but it usually has two wires that are like this that attach it to the heart. And I'll draw a diagram of how that works. So if you guys want to look at that, you can look at the pacemaker. And this is a modern implantable defibrillator. So they've gotten pretty small. These things generally go under the collarbone. Um, and so, but you'll notice it is bigger than the pacemaker. And so pacemakers and defibrillators these days, we usually put them in under the collarbone. And then they have one or two or three wires that connect them down to the heart. That um, allow the pacemaker to make the heart beat. And they're much more sophisticated now than when they first went in. They, um, they can detect the heart's normal beats, and so they only work if they're necessary. So if your heart's beating on its own, some people only need a pacemaker sometimes, and the pacemaker will just sort of sit and watch, and it won't start making the heart beat until, 
until the heart's not beating on its own, if it stops or if it slows way down or something. It can also detect arrhythmias, abnormal heart rhythms, and it can save that inside of the pacemaker. It's got like a little computer in there, and then when you come in, we can say, oh, look, you had AFib for four hours, you know, five months ago. Did you feel that? No, I didn't. Well, you're at risk of a stroke. Let's talk about that. And so they, the pacemakers have become very sophisticated. They still require these wires that go through a blood vessel and down into the heart. And the defibrillators are the same way. They basically go in exactly the same way. The wires go in the same place. The only difference is the device has this ability to shock you. And the wire is a little bit different because it has a little sort of part on it that can deliver the electrical shock. So in the last couple of years, they've come out with some other stuff. They have this thing that's called a subcutaneous defibrillator, and I'll pass this around. And you'll notice it's bigger than the traditional defibrillator. And you might say, well, it's bigger. It's newer and it's bigger. Why would it be bigger if it's newer? Well, it doesn't work exactly the same way as the traditional one. The traditional one has a wire inside of your heart. This new one is put in just below the skin, which is, this is below the skin too, but then it has wires that go inside of your chest. This new one goes in below the skin and it has a wire that goes just below your skin, so it doesn't go inside of your rib cage. Everything is what we call subcutaneous, or just below the skin, outside of the chest wall, basically. And it has to be bigger because it doesn't have a wire inside the heart. It needs to deliver more electrical energy to defibrillate the heart. But these are nice because you avoid a lot of the risks that go along with like having stuff inside your heart. Um, and, uh, and so nothing's touching your heart. And um, if if anything, like this is like anything that you know that is manufactured, it can wear out. And what do you do when the wires wear out? Like young patients in particular, you put a defibrillator in, and somebody who's in high school or something, or like you know college athlete, and you say, well, you, you might have this thing in for 50 years, 60 years. <laughs> But these wires only last 15 or 20 years. Okay, that's obviously a problem. You put this in, and we don't know how long the wires are going to last because they haven't been around that long, but we expect that they'll be at least as good and maybe better because they're not moving with each heartbeat. But then when you have to take it out, you're not dealing with something that's like inside the heart. You can deal with it a little more easily. So that's one of the things that has come out. Another thing that has come out, um, oh boy, it's so small. This is something called a weedless pacemaker, and this is like brand, brand new. This is actually just came out and um, it's been under testing for a while, but it just got approved last year in uh, about, right about May of 2016. It's a weedless pacemaker. The whole thing is contained right here in this little thing, about the size of a 22 caliber um, cartridge. And that goes inside the heart, and that's it. No, no surgical site, no wires, just this little pacemaker. Um, right now, the biggest downside of these is that it can only pace like one chamber of the heart at a time. I, I've heard they're working on one where you can put one up here and another one down here, because traditionally, most patients feel better with the, what's called a dual chamber pacemaker. But it's easy to put in, um, minimal sort of risks involved, no worry about having an incision to look after and a wound and what we call a pocket. Um, so that's a nice development. Yes? Not yet here. Um, I'm actually going out to a training session in. Uh, couple weeks in Minneapolis, which is where the manufacturer is based, and then we're gonna, we have a couple of patients that we have lined up that we think are good candidates for this, that are not good candidates for a traditional pacemaker for reasons like the blood vessels where we usually put the wires are plugged up because they've had surgery before or um, 
or some kind of a other thing in there that's caused the scar tissue there. So soon, but not yet. Um, and it's only been out for about a year and sort of, there's definitely something to be said for not being the very first person to do something. I don't really want my patients to sort of be the guinea pigs, right? I mean, it's good to be doing things that are new, but you don't want to be doing things that are too new. But it seems like most places that have been doing these have been having good results. So Yeah. Yeah, that's my understanding. I know some people who have, who have been doing these um, and have good results. How so, how is it placed? It's placed through a long um, tube, basically, a long catheter that goes in through the leg. It has a, um, it's like what the, it's called a delivery sheet. It's basically like a giant long drinking straw type of thing, but you can aim the curve of it, so you put it up. There's sort of a straight shot from the vein in the leg up to this chamber, which is the right atrium. Yeah, through the inferior vein cava, and then um, and then it goes down, and you saw those little sort of plastic hooks in there with tines. Um, the right ventricle, which is the chamber that they go in. I mean, the way I drew it, it's not really the way it looks. It actually has lots of little tiny um, like open fibers almost like um, you know like those green sponges you use in your kitchen that like to scrub things and there's sort of like lots of little fibers that are all kind of like interconnected that's the way the inside of the right ventricle is it's got they're called perfectulations and so the idea is that this thing goes in there and then it just sort of gets hooked in Power source. Yes, everything, battery and the electronics are all sealed in there. And there's any determination. We're told 10 to 12 years, and that's a good question. And one reason that I don't think right now this is a replacement for a traditional pacemaker is that we don't know what what the next step is going to be. And so my sort of my my feeling about this is that early on, in particular, the, um, they, they need to go into patients that don't have any other options um, because I'm not sure what we're going to do in 10 to 12 years. I mean, there have been, so they've been putting these in, in Europe for a little while, and I've sort of seen like x rays of patients that have two or three of them in there, and, and the idea is, well, you just leave it in and just put in another one. Well, that seems like, you know, I, mean, I guess that's one option, but there's only so much space in there. And so, and so um, and you all, whenever there's anything in the heart that's been in there for a while, you worry, like, if you pull it out, there's a risk of tearing a hole, basically, which is bad. So, like, so right now, right now, while it's definitely, it's definitely the coolest, it's definitely the coolest thing that I passed out and, um, and things, it's not a replacement or the current technology. It's sort of an adjunct or it, it's another tool, but it's not it's not a replacement. And that brings me to another to the next thing, um, which is um, something called the Watchman device. And that was approved in 2015. So I'm gonna draw another picture here. This is the last picture. So, getting back to atrial fibrillation, I talked at the beginning about how atrial fibrillation is um, generally benign, it's not dangerous, except it greatly increases the risk of stroke. It increases the risk of stroke by about five times. The reason for that almost always is um, that there's a little appendix off of the left atrium. So the four heart chambers, you have the right atrium, the left atrium, the right ventricle, and the left ventricle. And the normal heartbeat that we talked about is starting up here, and the top chamber squeezes, and then a fraction of a second later, the bottom chamber squeezes, bump, 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 bump. In 
atrial fibrillation, the electrical signals in the upper chambers go haywire, and the top chambers almost go into a kind of a cramp because there's electrical activity all the time, and they just, instead of squeezing, they just kind of like cramp up and they stop working and they stop squeezing. And this little appendix over here is the same way. It's normally squeezing with each heartbeat, but when you go into AFib, it just stops squeezing and cramps up. And so the blood that was going in and getting pushed out now just pools in there. And whenever blood pools, blood can form a clot. And so if you have a clot in your heart and it stays there, that's no big deal. But if it breaks off, it can go plug up the blood vessel in your head, plug the stroke, and that is obviously a big deal. So traditionally, there's only been one way to eliminate this risk, not eliminate, but reduce the risk. And that's been a medicine called Coumadin or Warfarin or Jantadin. Um, that's a blood thinner that you can take by mouth, and that was invented in the 1950s. And until the 2010s, it was the only one that wasn't injectable that was, that was a blood thinner. And in the last five or six years, there have been now four that have come out. There's Pradaxa, which is um, the tran There's Eliquis, which is a pixaban. There's Sorelco, which is Ribaroxaban. And there's some other one I don't know the name brand of called Doxaban. And those are all a, sort of another advance. I actually wrote down novel oral anticoagulant, no action companies, new agents that prevent blood clots from forming in the heart and reduce the risk of stroke in AFib, and they're not morphine. Um, and you don't have to get your blood tested, and you don't have to watch what you eat, and you don't have to worry so much about the medication interactions the way you do with morphine. And then in 2015, this thing got um, approved. It's called the Watchman. And this is another thing that we're um, doing here. And basically, all the stuff that I'm talking about now, I, I sort of realize I'm not going to have enough time to go into the next step to say what we do here. Everything I've talked about so far, we do here. Um, and this is, um, with the exception of one that we're going to be doing here, which I talked about. But the Watchman is something that we started this year. And this is a little device that basically goes in and plugs up this appendage. And right now, this is not a replacement for a blood thinner, but it is another treatment option for stroke risk reduction. And the reason it's not a replacement is because everybody that is at risk of stroke with AFib should be on a blood thinner, but not everybody is approved for this right now. It's only approved for people who have had trouble with bleeding of one sort or another, and not just like, you know, oh, I cut myself and I'm bleeding, but like serious bleeding. And so these also go in through the inferior vena cava. You have to poke a hole across the middle part of the heart um, because, the, because the veins come to the right atrium. And they have that similar kind of, it's a tube that um, comes up here to deliver this thing. And you put it in there and you sort of make sure that it's secure and then everything gets um, detached and it comes out. And you do have to be on a blood thinner at first because I'm, I'm gonna pass these around um, and uh, there's different sizes in here. I'm gonna pass around with cup. Be careful because you can um, injure yourself on these sharp things, which apparently are just fine for being inside the heart, but <laughs> they will poke themselves in the finger all the time. So, are those the real thing? Those are the real the, things, those are really yeah. Those are expensive. You may just want to also let people know to handle them gently. Is, is that my understanding? Yeah, I think that that's sort of obvious when you okay. see them. That they're actually more, um, they're, they are the real thing, but they're also, you know, we're not going to be putting those on the people after them. They're like, at this yeah. point, they're basically dirtier than money. You know, like, that's like money's dirty, you don't put it in your mouth. Like, that's pretty dirty. Everybody loves those. So, um, so you'll see when you look at it, though, that it has a sort of fabric mesh cover on it. That's not going to protect you against clots right away. The, the body sort of covers that over with a layer of cells. And that takes a while. That, that takes up six weeks or so. So you want to be on a blood thinner for at least that long um, after this device is put in and protecting against strokes. 
So, let's see, I think I've got it all this and, um, and so, one thing I didn't talk about though, I didn't talk about medications. There's sort of <coughs> medications for, for this stuff. Nobody wants to take medications. Medications aren't sexy. Um, but they're important. And, and it's important to have somebody who knows what they're doing when it comes to heart rhythm medicines. Because if it's not done correctly, the medicines can be, they can be life threatening um, in some cases. And so that's something that we pride ourselves on though here is sort of knowing when medications are appropriate and when something else is appropriate and knowing how to use all these different tools that we have. Um, and so some of the other things that um, I didn't talk as much about diagnostic services either. Um, I imagine at least some people in the room are familiar with the old Folter monitors, which were devices with patches, usually at least three, sometimes five or six, and a little box like a giant pager and you wear it around and it monitors your heartbeat. These days we have a patch monitor that just sticks on the outside of your chest in front of your heart and, um, and it stays on for two weeks and you can wear it in the shower, you can sort of go about your daily business, nobody knows you're wearing it because it's small and um, you can't swim with it, you can't take a tub bath with it, but other than that it's pretty much resistant to day-to-day -day life and, and it has a button on it that you can press if you feel your heart doing something funny and then we get all this data back. Um, but diagnostic services are a very important part of what we do. Um, and, um, and then the other things I talked about, about these devices and about how we put them in, but what I didn't talk about was you don't just put it in and then, and actually that's what they used to do, they used to put a pacemaker in and you see in like 15 years or when you start feeling tired and we'll give you a new one. But we follow them more closely now because we're getting so much more data from the devices and we're picking up things and we're we feel like we're really, um, you know, when you find that somebody has atrial fibrillation on their pacemaker and they didn't know about it, you're preventing strokes by making these diagnoses. And it takes um, it takes a lot of um, it takes a lot of manpower really to, to do all this stuff. One other thing I didn't talk about either was lead extraction. My partner, uh, Dr. Chadish, is the only person in New Hampshire or Vermont that does this. And this is, if you have a pacemaker or a defibrillator that's been in for a very long time at all, like more than a year, it gets scarred into place. And if it has to come out for some reason, and there are a number of reasons, um, from infection um, to somebody needs to get radiation therapy cancer and the devices in the, you know, where they're going to be given that. There's all kinds of reasons, but um, you can't, you don't just go in and pull it out. I mean, it's, sometimes you do, and that's great, but sometimes you have to use lasers or other things to get these out. He's the only person in the whole state that does that. Um, and so, uh, so Comfort Hospital offers that. It's really a sort of super, super specialized kind of thing. And, and fortunately, not a lot of patients need it, but when you need it, you need it. Um, and so, so to make all of this stuff happen, we have an arrhythmia clinic, which is the outpatient side of things. And we have two physicians, um, Dr. Chadish and me, and two device nurses who spend their entire time working with patients who have had pacemakers or defibrillators implanted. They specialize in the follow-up of those devices. Two technicians that do remote monitoring. Um, these devices can be monitored over the phone for battery life and, and, and things, and we can get all kinds of data from the family. So we have two people that do that, and also who sort of make sure that the follow up is appropriate if the battery level is getting low, we're keeping a closer eye on there, and so forth. Um, we have a dedicated scheduler, and we have a dedicated nurse coordinator for the watchman procedure and for some of the other sort of more complex stuff. And that's all the outpatient stuff. And then the inpatient is basically we have a complete electrophysiology lab staff, and that's sort of like our operating room. It's a specialized operating room with tons of technology 
Um, we recently upgraded some of our technology. I, was, I had a video that I was going to show about some of that, but it's not, it doesn't work. So. Um, this is our scheduler, uh, Nicole. Uh, Jen is one of our um, device nurses, and Amanda is our is our nurse coordinator. Um, Karen and Eileen are um, are the um, transtelephonic technicians. Karen is not working; um, she retired, and, and now Marilyn stayed in her place. And I didn't get to do enough photo. And then my partner, Dr. Chaudesh, uh, here um, in the EP lab with. Um, James, who is one of our P lab nurses, and there's uh, one, I don't know how many we have, eight, uh, eight or nine different people. And then this is um, this is the what we call the control room, um, where there's a lot of computer equipment. The EP lab is on the other side of this leaded window, which keeps out the X-ray uh, radiation that we use. And there's like about I don't know, six different computers um, that let us measure electrical signals and see all different kinds of stuff going on. And in some ways, I've heard, I don't, I'm not a pilot or anything, but I've heard people who do this and who fly planes say it's pretty similar because there's like about eight different things that you have to keep your eye on while you're doing these procedures, and any one of them can signify a problem, so you sort of always scan. And, um, and this is an example, it looks like blobs, but of the electrical um, mapping that we use. This is our old system, um, and it shows where different things are inside the part, and it lets us keep track of electrical signals and, and um, catheters, and, uh, and it helps us do these catheter-based procedures in the safest and most rapid manner possible minimizing the risk of complications and minimizing the sort of time you have to spend on the table. And so that's the old system, which we still use. Um, and then we have a newer system, which uh, I don't have any pictures of, unfortunately. So, and then I just have a couple more, more pictures. This is that subcutaneous ICD I talked with you about, the one that is entirely on the outside of the, of the uh, chest wall. So the, you can see the outline of the heart there, and it has a wire on one side of the heart, and then the device on the other side, so it makes its electrical circuit like that. This is that leadless pacemaker going in through this sort of special tube and delivery system into the right ventricle. And this is a little dark here, uh, but it's, you can sort of see there are these little fibers that are going through here that this device is basically designed to tangle up inside of. And, um, and then this is that Watchman device. So this is the, um, this sort of mirrors the four, the four chambers here, the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left ventricle, and left atrium, and then the little appendage here, and that device just sort of going in there and plugging that up. And um, so, yeah. And so this is, the follow-up to the video that we showed an hour ago, um, and this is 17 years later, so this actually happened in 2007, and this is a soccer player. I don't know what his medical condition is, but well, we already sort of, we could, and it's annotated, which I find a little bit annoying. Like but you can see him there, and then he he collapses, and he's in some kind of an arrhythmia, and he actually has an implantable defibrillator, and it's in there, and you see him sh get shocked, like, Oof. and then he sort of wakes up and gets up, and then I guess he asks if he played. <laughs> so, he requests to get back in the game. <laughs> I don't know if they let him get back in. But that is, so that's where our um, that's where our uh, field has come between 1990 and this is 2007. So um, I don't think there's anything on the last slide. It's just the same as the first slide. So I'll just put the first slide up. So there's a lot more in here. If anybody has any questions. <laughs> Cardiac physicians at Colorado.
Concord Hospital? Are you the only one to operate? <laughs> we're the only we're the only rhythm doctors, so cardiac electrophysiologists. I, mean, I think there's fifteen other cardiologists. There are three of them that do what we call interventional cardiology, doing stenting procedures and implanting um, heart valves through like through the leg, and there's one um, heart surgeon that does both heart surgery. So, um, so we're we're the we're the two electrophysiologists. There's probably I don't know. There might be like nine or ten electrophysiologists in the whole state, and there's probably a hundred cardiologists. So we're sort of like, like we do regular cardiology, but this is our focus. Yeah. Yeah. I visited a patient a couple of weeks ago who was getting ready for a case review, and he said something very interesting. I think he probably was, maybe not thinking clearly, but he was under the impression his heart was going to be stopped and the pacemaker was going to take over. And how do we get that to So. Some people's heart stops on its own, and it's certainly not supposed to do that. Um, and occasionally we see that where, where heartbeat will just stop, and that's obviously a disease, and that is a, that's something that can cause someone to faint. And so in that situation, a pacemaker will take over. The pacemaker doesn't cause the heart to stop, but the pacemaker is there to take over if and when the heart stops and hopefully prevent the person from passing out. But we're not making it stop. The pacemaker just treats the stoppage. Right, that's not how that would work. Very rarely there there is a sort of some limited circumstances where we might intentionally destroy the or eliminate the normal electrical system, but it's, it's, that would be pretty unusual. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just, uh, Doctor, you talked, uh, as you saw the charts in the beginning, as you age, the, yeah. the, the incidence is much greater. And you talked about one risk factor which had to do with obesity and things like that. Yeah. Is just aging a risk factor? Is your heart aging, it just kind of gets tired, yes. it, gets, it just doesn't want to work the same way? Uh, or are there other things? Absolutely. Like Particularly with the pacemaker, um, the problems that lead to somebody needing a pacemaker, um, one of the big ones is that this, the normal electrical system in your heart, um, there are a couple of different disease processes that affect it that basically cause it to work poorly. Um, one is that the electrical system gets replaced by sort of like fibrous tissue, like scar tissue almost. And so the areas where the normal wiring was have now been replaced by something else that is not wiring. Um, and then there's another process that, um, that happens where the wiring just degenerates and it doesn't work as well. But that absolutely does happen as people age. and. Um, most pacemakers are in folks who are older, um, no doubt about it. And that's the reason. It's, it's, um, it's not just because they all go down to Florida, somebody in Florida tells them they need a pacemaker. Um, it's because people in, in because seriously, like, the rates of pacemakers in Florida are a lot higher. But a lot of that is because of the people that live there. It's, it's, um, it's not, uh, yeah, it, it's not, um, really totally well understood, but it's definitely an aging process. And atrial fibrillation is the same way. There are changes that happen in the heart that cause the electrical system to not work as well as it's supposed to, and it can result in atrial fibrillation. And frankly, the same process, because a lot of people with atrial fibrillation end up being pacemakers too, and it's part of the same disease, so or the same cause.
So that's an, that's an interesting that's an interesting thing. I think mostly it's because the data isn't there. We don't know. And there are sort of two 